the forests of Madagascar are filled with some of the world's most unusual species. Chameleons crawl through the trees and over strange volcanic formations. The carnivorous fossa hunts rodents, birds, and ring-tailed lemurs. And perhaps the weirdest of all are the fat-tailed dwarf lemurs, with long tails and enormous eyes. These nocturnal primates only weigh about 160 grams and live on a diet of fruits, insects, and small animals. But that's only for half the year. For the other six or seven months, during the forest's dry season, these lemurs hibernate in tree holes, living off the fat stores in their tail. Their body temperature can fluctuate by as much as 20 degrees Celsius as the temperature outside their nests rises and falls. Their heart rate, breath rate, and brain activity levels also drop precipitously. And while hibernation is in no way the same as sleep, hibernation can actually lead to sleep deprivation. These little lemurs look pretty dead to the world. In fact, scientists recently discovered that two other species of dwarf lemur living in the high altitude forests of eastern Madagascar hibernate in underground holes, protecting themselves from near freezing temperatures. When the scientists uncovered their burrows, they found tightly curled up balls of fur, the lemurs deep in hibernation. These miniature lemurs are the only known species of primate to hibernate. But this seasonal switch to a decreased metabolism and reduced body temperature is widespread across the animal kingdom. We see it in freshwater turtles, ground squirrels, bats, and of course bears. It's an essential adaptation, allowing species to survive frigid winters and reduced availability of food. Not only that, but species that hibernate actually have longer lifespans than species of similar sizes that don't hibernate. Humankind has been aware of animals' ability to hibernate for thousands of years, going all the way back to ancient Greece and Aristotle. But we're still unraveling the mysteries of how they do it without losing muscle mass, bone density, and brain cells. Bears can survive without food for months at a time, and some species of turtle go for over 100 days without breathing. How do these animals manage such remarkable feats? Where did hibernation even come from in their evolutionary history? And could humans someday manage the same thing? The story of hibernation begins hundreds of millions of years ago, when Earth's landmasses were all clumped together in one supercontinent called Pangaea. During this time, a strange animal roamed the region that would become Antarctica, and spread as far as present-day India and southern Africa. The Lystrosaurus was a four-legged forager, with tusks in its upper jaw, generally growing to the size of a pig, but sometimes reaching two and a half meters in length. They are distantly related to modern mammals. Although the planet was much warmer 250 million years ago, the southern tip of Pangaea was still in the Antarctic Circle and experienced long stretches without sunlight every year. When researchers compared fossils of the Lystrosaurus found in Antarctica versus those found further north, they made a surprising discovery. Growth patterns in the tusks of those who lived around the Antarctic Circle showed annual marks of stress that are very similar to what we see in modern-day animals that go into hibernation. Those researchers hypothesized that this might be evidence of hibernation in some of our oldest mammalian ancestors. The ability to hibernate seems strongly related to the way reptiles manage their body temperatures and metabolisms, which is completely different from how mammals do it. In popular science, we think of reptiles as being cold-blooded, but the technical term for them is ectotherms. This means that they can't produce their own body heat and instead rely on the external temperature. That's why you'll see lizards and snakes and alligators basking in the sun or moving slowly when the temperature is cold. There are some big advantages to this strategy. They require a lot less food to power their metabolisms, and they can basically shut down their bodies when it's cold and survive for long periods without sustenance. Many species even have bouts of daily torpor, which is a little like hibernation, but lasts for much shorter periods and doesn't disrupt the body quite so much. Warm-blooded mammals, on the other hand, are endotherms, who generate their own body heat through metabolic processes. This means we can get up and go no matter the temperature, 
but we also have to eat a lot more. And we have a harder time surviving cold weather and long stretches without food. So how did our ancient ancestors evolve from being ectotherms into endotherms? It's a transition that would have taken a huge increase in metabolism, and doesn't seem likely to have happened all at once. Researchers now think there would have been an intermediate step, something like the Lystrosaurus, that was an endotherm, but could still change its body temperature during periods of cold weather or food scarcity. In other words, hibernation could be a holdover from the days of being ectotherms, a reptilian remnant from the past that many creatures still use today. And today, reptiles are still some of the most interesting examples of hibernators, using extreme techniques to allow them to survive in situations where any other animal would certainly die. Some of the best hibernators among the ectotherms are freshwater turtles, like the painted turtle and the snapping turtle, though technically their winter torpor is known as brumation. Because these reptiles live at northern latitudes, where winter can include freezing temperatures, they've had to come up with some incredible adaptations to make it through the cold season. When the weather starts getting icy, both species will head for shelter at the bottom of lakes and ponds. Once there, they decrease their metabolisms significantly and begin absorbing whatever oxygen is left in the water through a process known as cloacal respiration, aka butt breathing. The cloaca is an orifice used for waste removal and laying eggs, and adjacent to it are sac-like areas that are filled with blood vessels. When the turtles push water into these sacs, the papillae absorb the oxygen, almost like gills. In some species of turtle, this type of breathing can account for more than 50% of the oxygen they get while swimming. But if the winter lasts long enough and the body of water remains covered in ice for a long time, eventually the oxygen in the water will run out, which means not even butt breathing will allow the turtles to get any air. This is when snapping turtles and painted turtles depress their metabolisms even further, with their heart beating only once every five to 10 minutes. This is slow, and their cells are barely getting enough oxygen to create energy in the form of ATP. But then they do something remarkable. They switch to anaerobic respiration. This means that their metabolism is using glucose for energy without requiring oxygen. We can do anaerobic respiration, but by no means can it power our whole body to keep us alive. It's far less efficient than aerobic respiration, in part because it leads to a massive buildup of lactic acid in the blood. This could kill the turtles, if not for a handy trick that comes from having shells. The turtles are able to pull calcium and magnesium carbonates from their shells to neutralize the lactic acid, protecting themselves from harm. Thanks to the combination of all these abilities, painted turtles and snapping turtles are almost always perfectly fine after a long winter, although they can still freeze to death if their bodies are covered in ice for too long. With butt breathing and an ectothermic metabolism, these turtles have winter all figured out. But how do mammals survive similarly harsh conditions? Sure, they don't need to butt breathe, but they still need to eat to keep their bodies warm, right? How can such an energy demanding creature simply shut down for months at a time? Unlike reptiles, warm-blooded mammals generally need lots of food to fuel their metabolism, especially big mammals like bears. Brown bears need to eat about 5,000 calories a day. So how can they survive a winter without eating? One part of this is simple. When they're preparing for winter hibernation, their calorie intake jumps to about 20,000 calories a day. This helps them gain enough weight to survive the long winter ahead. Then, once the bear enters their winter den, they go for as long as 100 days without eating, drinking, exercising, urinating, or defecating. But unlike other hibernators, their internal temperature only drops about 5 degrees Celsius, and they still occasionally move around. Scientists have argued over whether bears are true hibernators because this looks so different than what's seen in smaller mammals. But a bear's heart rate slows to only four beats per minute, and their oxygen consumption drops by 75%. So they're clearly still slowing their metabolism down in a way that looks just like hibernation. 
it seems that the problem with reducing their body temperature so drastically would be in warming themselves back up. They're such large animals that the energetic cost is much higher than for bats or squirrels. That said, they still have some wild tricks for surviving the long winter. While humans experience bone thinning and muscle wasting with prolonged periods of bed rest, bears are able to shut down the genes involved with the breakdown of bone while in hibernation. This means they emerge from hibernation weighing a lot less than when they started, but most of that weight is fat, not muscle and bone. On the other end of the spectrum from bears are the Arctic ground squirrels. Since they live in Canada, Alaska, and Siberia, they spend about seven months of the year in nests buried below the tundra. Their body temperature falls to the lowest level ever measured in any mammal, as low as negative 2.9 degrees Celsius. And when their plasma was sampled during this frigid temperature, researchers found it had remained liquid despite not having any antifreeze chemicals in it. How is it possible for their very liquid blood to not freeze at these below freezing temperatures? Scientists have hypothesized that they use supercooling, a process in which water goes below freezing temperatures without forming ice because there are no impurities to start the crystallization process. But the squirrels don't stay in deep hibernation for the entire winter. They go through interbout arousals every two to three weeks shivering their body temperature back up to 36.4 degrees Celsius, which lasts for about 12 hours. Hibernating mammals expend about 70% of their energy stores for these brief periods of arousal, which help them regulate normal body functions. Like bears, Arctic ground squirrels come out of hibernation without any muscle wasting or brain damage, which has led scientists to wonder could we harness some of the same tricks and apply them to humans? For those of us who don't love freezing during the winter months, hibernation might sound like an ideal way to get through the cold weather. But the possibilities for human hibernation go far beyond comfort and convenience. Imagine what might be possible with long-distance space travel if rockets didn't have to be equipped with so much food and water for astronauts because they'd be in hibernation for most of the voyage. It could help them avoid interpersonal conflicts and the mental strain of being in a tiny metal box for months at a time. And it might even have health benefits too. Researchers found that rats placed in a medically induced torpor experienced less harm from radiation which could be a promising development for humans. And if we could avoid brain damage, as well as muscle and bone loss like other hibernating mammals, that would be a huge development for astronauts who already deal with some of those problems on relatively short space missions. While this concept might sound like something out of science fiction, it's already being adapted in more limited ways for medical purposes. By cooling the body and the blood of patients, doctors are able to perform more extreme heart surgery without killing the individual. This therapeutic hypothermia can protect the brain from damage caused by reduced oxygen and allows patients to make a faster recovery. And there are even some examples of people who have survived prolonged freezing, such as a hiker who was found after 24 days of exposure and whose body temperature had dropped to 22 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. His body had entered a state of torpor, and after being found, he was able to make a full recovery. And just as it is for bears and arctic ground squirrels, the keys to hibernation may lie hidden in our genome. If hibernation is a remnant from our ancient mammalian ancestors, most experts agree that it's an ability that most mammals have simply lost over time. The genetic underpinnings may still very much be in our DNA. By sequencing and understanding the genomes of today's hibernators, scientists are getting closer to understanding how they activate the groups of genes needed for hibernation. This all offers a tantalizing possibility, not only that we may be able to travel further into the solar system, but also that we could extend our lives and survive strokes, heart attacks, and severe injuries. If little primates like dwarf lemurs can do it, and enormous mammals like bears can do it, who's to say that it will never be possible for humans? Maybe one day we'll be able to pass the winter away from the quiet peacefulness of our own hibernation pods. 
but we can only begin to guess at what comes next for our species if we understand our evolutionary journey. What our future holds is shaped by our past. A past so bizarre that it caused humans to become basically the weirdest animals to ever walk the earth. We're the only creatures to walk on two legs, besides kangaroos, sort of. The only primate to lose basically all of its fur. The only animal to throw, to speak, to write down its language. We're an animal that became so smart, with brains so giant, that we basically shouldn't be able to exist. And yet, here we are. Why did we get so weird? How did we diverge so drastically from the other primates? Why did evolution select us to become emotional walking monkeys equipped with a supercomputer for a brain? The complexity of human evolution blows my mind and is the subject of our new series, Becoming Human, available exclusively on Nebula. This is our most ambitious project yet, and we wouldn't have been able to do it without Nebula. Nebula is a streaming platform that was created by us, by the educational YouTube content creators who were tired of worrying about if their ideas would suit the YouTube algorithm's desires. Sometimes the content we want to make is experimental, too long, too short, or contains themes that would get it demonetized instantly on YouTube. Sometimes we want to make content that doesn't exactly fit on our regular YouTube channels. Or sometimes, like in the case of Becoming Human, we want to make a beautiful, standalone piece. Nebula is our baby, and by signing up, you are directly supporting us, getting to watch all of your favorite content ad-free, and also getting access to tons of exclusive content. Becoming Human is one example of many great original shows. Other noteworthy examples are City Beautiful's Great Cities series, which explores the most important moments of the greatest cities on Earth. Or Neo's Underexposure series, which brings to light the dark aspects of important historical moments. And on top of original content, if you sign up with my link, you get free access to Nebula classes, where our creators host classes on how to make the content you know and love. All the classes are taught by the creators on Nebula, so you can learn how Alex the Low Spec Gamer makes videos on a budget, or how Foran tells stories, or how Patrick Willems makes movies. Your favorite creators teaching you how they create. If you've ever wanted to become a content creator or video maker, or are just curious how it all gets done, this is a great place to start. So if you sign up for Nebula using the link below, you can get Nebula for a little over two and a half dollars per month or $30 for the entire year. A portion of this subscription fee goes directly to us, and the rest goes towards building this platform to become the best streaming platform out there for viewers and creators.